Hi, this is um, the Green Roofs Lecture. So um, we were going to get started actually with a video. So the um, video that we have here is from NPR, our first video that we'll watch. Um, so enjoy and then we will start talking specifically about green roofs. This is the largest green roof in New York City. It's in the middle of bustling Manhattan on top of the Javits Convention Center, a behemoth of a building with a six block footprint. But the roof hasn't always been green. Before 2014, it was totally barren. Now, just a few years later, when people walk out onto the roof, they say things like, Amazing, that's great, I didn't expect this, what a surprise. But besides the great reactions, there are practical benefits. Uh, we have 300,000 bees. We've seen 25 different species of birds on the roof. We reduce the temperature up here by about 6 degrees Fahrenheit. And we also save about 7 million gallons of stormwater runoff that's absorbed in the, the soil and the plants that are on our roof. So we've been able to reduce our energy consumption by about 26%. And that translated for us last year into a saving of about $3 million. That is impressive. How does one green roof get so much done? And what are all of the not green roofs in New York City doing with their lives? First, let's see how much roof space actually exists. You know, they are a major part of urban landscapes. The, the round number that most of us think is about one billion square feet. One billion with a B. That's like 22 times the size of Central Park in roofs. And in most cities, what isn't roof is another impermeable surface, like road, sidewalk, or parking lot. And these surfaces create a lot of problems for cities that green roofs can actually help solve. Let's take a look at three of these issues. The first is stormwater runoff. Rainwater goes into pipes. It combines with what's called sanitary water. When there's too much rainwater, which happens hundreds of times a year around Manhattan, the, the, the wastewater treatment facilities really shut down and these valves just let the water just, you know, shunt out into the rivers. You know, it's got human sewage. It's the biggest source of pathogens to the Manhattan Island. With green roofs, that water, instead of going into the drains and polluting the environment, ends up just evaporating to the atmosphere to leaves these plants. And then there's what scientists call the heat island effect, which basically means that cities are significantly warmer than the surrounding areas. Well, I've seen asphalt roofs get up easily 170, 180 degrees Fahrenheit in the, in the strong sunlight. They absorb about 90 to 95 percent of the sunlight. Green roofs, by comparison, are close to air temperatures. Another problem green roofs can help solve is habitat loss. Cities can shrink or destroy the green space that's crucial for certain plants and animals to survive. Currently, a lot of species might occur in smaller parks throughout the city that are relatively unconnected, uh, but having high densities of green roofs would allow those patches to be more connected, letting, for example, butterflies travel from patch to patch with lots of stepping stones and green roofs in between. And these are just three of the problems green roofs can help solve. But to really put a dent in any of these issues, cities would have to implement green roofs at a large scale. Stuart Gaffin, the research scientist you heard from earlier, estimates that if all of New York City's one billion square feet of roof space were greened, those green roofs could lower the city's temperature by nearly two degrees Fahrenheit and absorb over 10 billion gallons of stormwater each year. As cities continue to grow, all that empty roof space starts to look more and more like an opportunity, an untapped resource, a future ecosystem of problem-solving meadows in the sky. Okay, so, so basically when we talk about a green roof, um, we are talking about a roof are as extensions of the existing roof um, that involve the creation of some kind con contained green space um, on top of a human-made structure. So it can be at or below, above, above grade, but it's always separate from the ground. So it's above the ground um, or below, <laughs> but it's separate. Um, and again, it's modular or built up um, of, on top of a man-made structure. So what do they provide? Why would you install a green roof? Well, specifically, they provide ecosystem services, as you saw in the video, stormwater management, energy conservation, habitat creation, um, air quality improvement, extending the life of the, of the roof. Because again, 
it has that um, enhanced membrane, um, urban beautification, as well as urban agriculture. So we'll go over um, these benefits um, in more detail. Specifically for stormwater management, again, studies have shown that it can reduce the, the total building runoff from 60 to um, 80%. So even though 79%, so even though all of the roof, the runoff that hits that roof um, goes to the green roof on major storm events, it's not going to be able to hold all of that, but it's going to be able to hold more than your reference roof. So here we see on very large rainfall events here, um, this is in Ottawa, Canada in 2002. Um, you can see that the runoff in the reference roof is almost similar to the actual runoff of the rainfall itself. But if you see for these um, minor events, the, um, which is most events, um, it's able to manage most, if not all, of that um, rain stays within the green roof. Now for major events, again, that um, it's only going to be able to fill in um, the storage space that it has, and then it's going to start running over. So you see less of benefits for the very large events. But for the overall events, um, we see um, for the rain runoff ratio, especially for the smaller events, it's able to retain that. So basically, this three to five inches of growing media absorbs um, the stormwater when the rain events are one half inch or less. Um, and it also filters those pollutants that would otherwise run to um, the system because, again, this, rat, this um, root system um, is going to detoxify any toxins that are there. For energy conservation, again, it reduces um, heat transfer from the atmosphere into the building, um, can reduce cooling loads. You see anywhere from 10 to 20, 30 percent. Um, and a lot of this has to do with that peak demand. So the idea being that if you have extra insulation, then the peak demand where it's three o'clock in the afternoon, that you're gonna kind of reduce that peak demand because the extra insulation is gonna keep the coolness trapped in and keep the heat out. Um, and um, again, the most bang for your buck is buildings that have a high roof to wall ratio. So, so shorter buildings. Are going to do better so the, the changes in cooling load really depends on the height of the building um, and again they do this by promoting evapotranspiration so that actually cools right above the building it does cool it through that evapotranspiration process they provide shade and again it's that huge thermal mass that's there that again is going to reduce the atmosphere getting into um, the heat in the atmosphere and so if we look here at the daily flux here you have a reference roof and here they have different green roofs. And so this is the heat flow. And so you can see in the summer when the reference root is very high, these heat flows for the um, green roof is quite low. But again, it does vary by year. Um, so again, this idea is that a lighter couple surface is going to reflect more light. So some of things like just paint it white and that actually does a lot for a heat island reduction, but the idea with a green roof is not only does it have that same benefit, but it also has the added benefits with stormwater management habitat um, thermal mass that just a white roof wouldn't have. Um, again, with this habitat, so this is another um, um, study that looked at green roofs as a traditional roof and looked at, um, looked at different species. And you can see here, that um, the species count again was much higher with the green roof compared to the other roof. Um, so again, the species rich and correlated with nesting birds, habitat, insect population. Oops. In addition to um, habitat, we also have an improvement in air quality. Again, the plants are gonna use the CO2 to produce oxygen. And the particulate matter, again, is going to come down on the roof and, and be absorbed by this media versus it coming down and running off, um, coming onto an impervious surface and running off to a waterway. Um, indirectly, the air quality is, again, um, less air conditioning load. Um, the higher the temperature, so again, the reduction of the heat island effect actually reduces smog um, because the higher the um, temperature, the more smog you have. Um, as well as ground um, level ozone is a component of the smog, which can irritate and aggravate asthma. Um, again, this idea that it protects the life of the roof. Again, this, this idea that the roof itself, if you have a regular roof, a shingled roof, uh, it would be exposed to weather, 
um, UV radiation and daily temperature fluxes. Um, it's estimated that the green roof, because it has this huge surface on top of there, you're not getting um, weather events, you're not getting UV, and you actually have this huge thermal mass there. And so it's estimated that it could double or even triple the life of, the, of, the, of a regular roof. Um, again, it reduces stress on this by um, life by up to 20 years. Um, and so if you think about the cost of the green roof being higher, you need to think that, you know, also about the cost of replacing a regular roof and factor that in. Um, again, the benefits, the protecting biodiversity, the urban quality of life. Another is the noise transfer. So this idea that you have this huge thermal mass, so the, the traffic noise and other noises on the outside, less of it's going to come inside the building through the roof at least. Um, by um, by these this thermal mass being there and reducing its basically soundproofing it. Um, again, the idea is that it could enhance your property values with higher occupancy rates. You can charge more uh, with return on investment of your building value. Um, so again, what a green roof is is again it's a high quarter waterproof. So we have a membrane first, and then we have a root repellent system with a drainage system. We actually collect this water a filter cloth, and then obviously we have plants in the growing media. It can be modular with this, again, drainage layer filter cloth growing the media and blocks, so just grids that we put on, or it can be a continuous system. Again, this really originated in Europe where um, they just put sod. For hundreds of years, they've used sod as the roofing material on top. And again, now in Germany, um, more than one in 10 flat roofs in Germany is, is green. Um, so if we look at this system, so here's kind of the, the base of the building. First, you're gonna have some sort of insulating or waterproof material. So you're gonna have some sort of like a rubber membrane there that's your waterproof material. On top of that, um, you're going to have your protection and storage layer. And we'll talk a little bit about what that might look like and it's, it differs. Um, over that, um, again, you have your, your drainage or capillary layer where we collect the water. Um, here is where it comes through the drainage layer and it's collected here in our storage layer. Um, on top of the drainage layer, we have a um, filter layer. So again, we want to keep the roots from coming into our drainage layer. And then we have our media. And then finally, we have our plants. So this is a different way of looking at it. But again, you have your support structure, your roofing membrane, um, this protection barrier. We might have insulation in there. Um, and then we have, again, this water storage. So it acts often as these little cups, these cones, um, but there's different ways at which that can, um, can do. And again, it's going to actually have an outlet at some point too, just like a normal roof would, if, so that if it's going over, there is an outlet. And then our growing media and our vegetation. And so this is, again, just another look at, at the different things that can do. Each one has their own system in terms of the drainage board, the drainage layer, and what that looks like. So there's proprietary, you know, we use this growing media and it's the best, or we use this type of drainage layer. And so there's different companies that have come out with different materials in terms of what type of drainage layer they use and what type of insulation as well as what type of growing media that they use or filter. But again, so this is your, your um, waterproofing, um, your drainage board right here, um, your root separation, and then your um, plants on the top. So there's two types of green roof. There's extensive, which is just your basic green roof, a living roof. So it's often shallower, one to five inches of growing material, and you usually use hardy plants. And the reason why you do that is because you're not gonna get up there and water them and put fertilizer in there all the time. And so often it's just accessible for maintenance and you just kind of let them go. Um, and so often we use set sedum, and so you see these um, as kind of on a typical green roof. It's a succulent. And the reason why we use it is because it's, it's, a, it's a hardy, it's a flowering plant, um, but it stores water in its leaves. So it helps bring up some of that water that's going through and actually stores that water. But then that, that stored water helps it go through drought periods when you don't have a lot of water. And again, it doesn't have really long roots. The roots stay fairly shallow. So you get some root treatment through that, but it's not gonna go down too far. Um, and then again, it also spreads out horizontally. So you can print one and it'll spread out throughout your green roof. Um, and then again, it can trap dust and consume CO2 like any plant. Um, so the other type is intensive. So the intensive, so extensive, you can think of like, you know, set them going extensively across the top of the roof. Intensive means 
we're going to do a lot here. It's an intensive roof. And so you can think of this as a garden. So this is where we might use um, deeper growing media. So we might actually have a foot of growing media. Um, we might use um, crops. We might use more delicate plants. Um, we might have to prune. Um, again, we need to be able to take the load because that extra um, growing media is going to be heavier as well as the extra because it's 12 feet. That's more water we get to absorb, which is great, but that's actually more weight as well. Um, and for an intensive roof, we actually have to have two exits. Um, we have to have a barrier at least three and a half feet high around the roof for protection of the people who are up there. We have to raise the smokestacks up above um, a normal person's height um, so that you're not having any sort of exhaust going to where people are. Um, and then you have to account for people in there when you do your capacity load. Um, so there's a little bit more, um, if you're going to have people up there regularly, you have to build it differently and you have to um, put into the weight into that. Um, so drawbacks and limitations, again, as a rule of thumb, they cost between 30 to 50% more than a conventional roof. But again, the idea is that you might not have to replace your roof. So if it's 50% more, but you don't replace it, um, you get double the life, then it's actually about the same. If you think about it with a lifetime, the problem is, you know, for a typical homeowner, they might not live in that house for that entire period, but for government buildings, for office buildings, for things where you know your occupancy is going to be um, for many, many years, then it would make sense to build a green roof. Again, they can start at anywhere from four to eight um, feet per cubic square, um, per square foot. Um, and again, that includes all the materials, the preparation work, the installation, um, whereas tr traditional roofs, we can get that up in, in hours, right? Um, and again, we're using shingles, um, which are, you know, fossil fuel based and tar and, and cheaper things. Um, but we have to also understand that not all roofs can support the weight. Normally we do them on flat roofs. They can be slightly tilted, but not very tilted. Um, so that we can keep our plants on um, and our, our media intact. Um, and it needs to be able to support the extra weight. But again, those are some drawbacks and limitation, but we do get these energy savings, increased membrane life, stormwater fee reductions. If you do have a stormwater fee for your area, or you're building your commercial complex. Um, so there is a lot of, of um, extra savings, even though the costs may be higher. Um, these are just some examples of some really great green roofs. So this again would be an intensive roof. So it has a beautiful um, uh, creek, a little uh, water um, feature through it. This is actually the Schwab Rehab Hospital. It's actually really interesting. They did a lot of studies with this hospital and the green roof and actually looking at um, recovery rates to see if this kind of idea of being out in the open and smelling the fresh air, if actually helped with um, recovery um, to benefit the patients. And so uh, anyway, they, they did see I think a slight improvement. Um, this is a, um, I, I love this one too. This is um, again, all of, all of these green roofs we have here. This is another one with a water feature. So again, holding even more water in addition to in the media itself. This one's in New York City, so this is actually on top of a parking garage, and this is where they actually grow crops um, for um, at a farmer's market. So this is, an, again, another intensive, and so they actually have an irrigation system here. So, um, so it's actually irrigated, and here they are doing harvesting, of, again, another intensive. Um, here's when you, when you can kind of see some of these modular. So this is, we talked about them being flat, but we can do it on a non-flat roof, but what we're gonna have is make sure that we have systems here to keep everything in place. So it's a modular system where you can see they have these dividers to keep those modular systems in place, but it can still serve a purpose on a tilted roof. This is in a garden shed in, in North Carolina. Um, here we have another uh, beautiful one in my opinion. Um, here's another green roof and a beautiful view of that. Um, again, this one's not with sedum, so it's with different plants. So again, it doesn't have to be sedum. Um, this is again another um, tilted roof. So again, it's mainly sod, um, but this is in, in Anchorage, Alaska. Here's another sod tilted roof. Um, here's again some more sod roofs. Here's some flat roofs that are also sod. I love this how it's just built right into the landscape. Um, here's some again tilted roof and sod. This is in Europe. Um, and here is a um, again an intensive green roof where they have several leathers. They have planters with trees. Um, and again, you can see all the different plants that they have in the system. And you, again, you can see this barrier 
Um, so that's again gonna be required if there's gonna be people up there for safety. And so finally, we're gonna end this lecture with um, a preview of one of the most famous um, green roofs, and that's the High Line. So we're gonna discuss the High Line in class, um, but I want you to watch this video, so please watch the whole video, and then we'll have, um, this will be the end of the lecture when the video is over, and then we will discuss the High Line, which is beautiful in New York City. If you haven't been, you should go um, in class on, um, on Tuesday. I don't think uh, either Robert or I could have could have ever really imagined uh, anything quite as wonderful as what the Highline has become. You know, we just thought, wow, you have a mile and a half in Manhattan. Uh, why, why rush to tear it down? Let's think about what else it can be. What else can you do with it? Recycled from a defunct elevated railway. High Line is a fantastic world of woodlands, thickets, prairies, and meadows, floating 30 feet in the air through 22 blocks of New York City. It is at once a monument to a bygone era and the centerpiece of a revitalized West Side. The High Line is all about being in the city. It's an escape, but it's not an escape from the city. It's an escape from your normal experience of the city. It's about reconnecting with the city from a completely new vantage point. Um, so you're moving through the city in a new way and seeing the city in a new way. Uh, you can see the Statue of Liberty looking one way. You can see the Empire State Building looking the other. It is a, a mile and a half long line that's a lot like a gallery and a museum, if you will, that allows you to experience the city in an extraordinary way, where the city is now the exhibit. Like the railroad it replaced, the new park rises above busy streets and runs in one side of buildings and out the other, as it winds its way from the historic meatpacking neighborhood through Chelsea to Hell's Kitchen. The whole experience is magical. It's slightly elevated, but not too high. So it, it protects you from the street, but yet you feel the energy of the street. And also you're near the water. You really are parallel to the river. That also adds yet another dimension and another sense of air and space and hope and freedom and all the things we like. The High Line is an Art Deco masterpiece of industrial design. Massive, yet elegant, its style is defined by the geometric patterns of the guardrails wherever it bridges a street. The way the High Line is constructed, it's constructed out of layers of steel. And there are millions of rivets, hundreds of thousands of rivets. It was just an amazing piece of engineering and construction. After the last train ran in 1980, the High Line sat neglected for nearly two decades. Finally, it was slated for demolition. But locals Robert Hammond and Joshua David didn't want to see it go. To save it from the wrecking ball, they formed Friends of the High Line in 1999. We both fell in love with the High Line first, viewing it from the street. We never saw what was on top of it. But then when I walked up here for the first time in the summer of 99, it, there was a mile and a half of wildflowers growing up. I mean, literally, we're having to wade through, you know, waist high with these white flowers that were blooming. And when that vista opened up, it was just uh, this huge, incredibly beautiful piece of open space that's uh, a block away from my house that has been here all the time that I've lived in New York and I never even knew it was here. The High Line changed me the moment that I saw it. This incredible old piece of urban infrastructure had turned into a magical garden in the sky. And how brilliant of both Josh and Robert to get an incredible photographer to take pictures of what it looked like up there so that everybody could see that this was a magical place, a wild, dynamic landscape. When I went up on the High Line with Robert and Josh on that cold March morning, it didn't look like much at all. But I spent my whole artistic life following the seasons, and I knew that in a month or two it would bloom. CSX Transportation, the owner of the High Line, 
gave Joel Sternfeld permission to photograph on the railroad for a year. And in May, it was like being in a, a meadow in the Alps. And Memorial Day weekend, the city was empty. And I was alone on the highlight, photographing the Star at Lehigh building. And I realized I'd rather be here than any place in the world. And this is that same spring. It, people look at this and they think that I've done something digitally, and I haven't. This is just how the High Line looked that year. You know, I said there wasn't a picture that was my favorite, but this is it. That little lavender purple color is so subtle, so delicate, and that touch of green there. Every time I walked by it and there was that little tinge of purple heather, my heart just skipped a beat. I, I just loved it. Joel Sternfeld's evocative photographs ignited the campaign to save the High Line. Joel's images were the images we always used when we were saying the High Line should be preserved, the High Line needs to be saved, don't tear the High Line down. In time, New Yorkers fell in love with Sternfeld's images of the wildscape growing on the derelict railway. My wife called me, she was in Chelsea, and she said, you've got to come up here and see the High Line. And I went up there, and people were stretched out in the chaise lounges. They could have been in their own backyards. They, they were in that invisible bubble that New Yorkers create around themselves, relaxing and talking and doing things as if no one was there, even though a thousand people an hour was walking by them. So I, I think uh, it's a real New York park. It's a real bit of New York. All right. Well, thank you very much. And we'll talk about this more in class.